two, one. We are live in the present tense with Sam Stewart, and anyone points to them. WNJR Washington and online at WNJR.org. Hope everyone is doing well on it this Thursday night. We are back for episode two of Staff Week here on the present tense. We had Euphoria Brazier on Tuesday night. That was a great episode. We did a great one lined up for you tonight as well. My guest on the show tonight returns to the show tonight after previously joining season six of the show. He works at the Office of Counseling Services as a former Division I basketball player at Longwood University. Everyone, welcome back on the show tonight. Demarin, Jeter, Demarin, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. Glad to be back. And hopefully some of my present, pre- predictions come true this time because Sanza 6 was not good last time. That was not. <laughs> but we'll give you a chance to make some new predictions tonight. But, you know, we're going to get to some, some topics first we kind of touched on last time. And, you know, I, I think one thing that's really cool is, you know, we talked to you, Feo. He's a, a former D2 soccer player. We were just talking about, you know, some of the challenges that athletes go through. But, you know, specifically working in the world of counseling, you know, it's been, uh, in the past few years, more popular for athletes to talk about their struggles, things like that. So from the student athlete perspective, how do you feel like student athletes have unique challenges to mental health? What kind of things that may be unique to the student athlete population do they have to deal with? Well, I would say, one, it goes without saying, of course, the balancing of the academics and playing in your sport, if like attending practices and then like having to attend class. Uh, I think that's, of course, like uh, probably like the most major struggles. Um, but then also you want to think about like pressure to perform. Um, you want to talk about like the sacrifice that comes with it, like time away from family, time away from friends, um, not being able to fully dictate your time and have someone else responsible for your time. Hmm. Um, and then also thinking about like travel and how that can affect a person and thinking about your life outside of your sport. So whatever background you come from, like family life, uh, whatever financial environments you come from. So there are a lot that kind of goes into being a, a student athlete and at any one moment, some of these things can feel uh, overwhelming and, and can affect play and things mm. of that nature. Now, here's an interesting question I, I asked you, Fan, and I know you're not too far out of college, but I feel like every year now, society, there's things changing with technology and societal pressures that come from technology and amongst a plethora of other things, but how do you feel like being a student athlete has changed since the time you were in college? <laughs> uh, well, I would say the biggest thing that has changed, which I still don't know how I feel about it because I miss this, is NIL. <laughs> um, that ability to kind of make money um, from your name, image, and likeness, I think that has definitely changed sports in a, a, a lot of different ways. Mm. Um, you think about the way the transfer rule has changed in the portal and how prevalent right. and prevalent that has been. So I think there's more um, movement among athletes, uh, which is different from when I was in college. And at first, it was just like the coaches that just moved on a year-to-year basis, but now the athletes have the power to dictate and choose what they want for their mm-hmm. career, like more of a save in the like, financial aspect. So, of course, I wish I could have made a little bit more money. <laughs> so do you feel like, and I think the transfer portal thing applies D1 to D3 all the way through. You know, People can transfer at any level up and down now or you know, within the level. But NIL may not be as popular at D3, but you know, some people do have deals. But do you think, and maybe take them with separate issues, do you think NIL is good for college sports? And do you think the transfer portal is good for college sports? Oh, that is a complicated question. It, it is, and I will say it's like, I go both ways on it. Cause you know, I'm, I'm a Duke fan, we have Ryan Leonard, and we lost Notre Dame this year, now he's playing for Notre Dame. Like, and it's, it's like, okay, you know, that's a, you know, a better football school, but it's tough though as a fan. But at the same time, I don't want to feel like I'm restricting anyone. So I feel like it's difficult. And NIL, you know, I feel like that's such a nuanced issue as well. There's papers and academic articles we learned about that. But with all that said, what's your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully this doesn't feel like a cop-out answer for <laughs> um, But I think, I, I do think both are good for the sport, um, whatever sport you play. I do think both are good. But I also think there's always a balance um, with it. And I think the balance is how much um, when you think about transferring, how much is it do, what's the, like, what's the balance between learning how to um, stay there, wait your turn, mm. um, be patient, um, show like perseverance, hard work mm. um, versus going to a situation you think is best for you. So like, what is that balance there? Um, it's like, it's kind of like one of that instant gratification mm. instead of like, the journey. So I think that's one part of it, like what's the balance there? And from the NIL standpoint, I think it's 
all of course good to make money off your name, image, and likeness because all the students that are not college um, athletes or student athletes, they have the ability to make money at any point in time and they don't have a cap on what they can make, whatever they can get, that's go get it. Um, but then I think it can get, um, I think the balance is, oh, is that the driving force be, be behind all your decisions you're making mm -hmm. for your career and things like that. So I think that's where the balance is. So hopefully that doesn't sound like a cop out. Answer. No, that's good. Because I think also like in some situations you might need to <coughs> transfer because you're in an unfair situation, whether mm -hmm. situations that might be the right decision uh, or maybe not be the right decision transfer and stay at the school. Are you excited for NCAA 25? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one good thing is coming to NIL, right? Yeah, yeah, Among yeah. other things, yeah. but yeah. So that were you in college when that when fourteen the last one came out? Uh, I mean, are you a fan of these games? I am a fan of these games, and it's funny because I feel like you was trying to indirectly call me old. <laughs> 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 so, however, I was. Where was I? I was actually probably a freshman in college, actually, okay. um, when that first when NCAA 14 was out. Um, but I was always, I always loved the NCAA football games, the campus legends. Yeah. The campus legend mode, winning the Heisman. All the memes are so <laughs> funny right now. It's like me when I'm taking my mid-major school at the Penn State wide out. Uh, I think the same people said, like, the, we're not ready for this accurate grind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, are you more of a, a football game, like a Madden guy, or you're a 2K guy? Because I know basketball, like, I think more than any other sport, basketball players are into 2K. But 2K is also such a toxic game, so I don't know if you have problems with that. Are you a 2K guy? No, I am a 2K guy, but I actually think I'll, I prefer playing Madden to 2K. Okay. Um, I just, I think I've always just loved football more. Um, I oh, really? Think if, you, if you think about basketball and, and football, football is more team-oriented. And like you need more of the team to win, as far as like basketball, typically you know the five out five guys on the court. If you have a really good one guy, he can like control the game. If you you can think about LeBron on the Cavs early on and things right. like that, like the rest of the supporting guys, like they're NBA players, but LeBron was so generational, he could carry them further than they probably would have would otherwise. So I've always been a big football fan. Um, that, more of that. That's interesting. And I, I was thinking about what well, about the Chiefs? The Chiefs also had a really good defense this year, yeah. so. But, okay, interesting, that's awesome. Um, so my next question for you is, how did you deal with performance anxiety as an athlete? You know, you said that's one of the big challenges, and I definitely wanted to get to that tonight. Did you have kind of a pre-game, you fan talking about who used to listen to Bob Marley, get his groove on before the game. Did you have like a, kind of a ritual or routine? Did you have something you thought about before the game? Um, Calm your nerves. Before the game, let's just, I would probably say listening to the, like the same playlist okay. all the time. Like I'll have the same select songs I would always play. So in college, my pregame routine looked drastically different than high school. So college, I got to the so let's say we had a game at seven. I probably got to the gym around probably like five. Okay, was on the court around six, like doing some early shooting things like that, and just like listening to music. So I went through the same routine for there. Um, as far as like performance anxiety, it's just always reminding myself um, of the preparation and the work that I put in. Mm. Um, that at the end of the day, I put so many hours in behind the scenes without the lights on, that when the lights did come on, that I was, I could be confident and that I'm prepared enough um, for this game. And like I studied the scouting report enough and things like that. So I think in those times of anxiety, like the preparation takes over. Mm. That's an awesome answer. And you know, one thing we've talked about is this, you know, kind of idea of mental health and athletics. And, you know, we kind of touched on this last time, but I want to dive a little bit more deeply into this tonight. You know, Kevin Love, Naomi Osaka, Simone Biles, Michael Phelps, some of the names, some of the best athletes in their sport have spoke out about some of the performance anxiety um, and some of the struggles they've had really in their sport on the field and off. So what do you think it is about this cultural moment? And what do you think the total impact of these athletes speaking out of this? I think that this has had a significant impact on the culture. I think it has gotten to the point that it's almost like athletes are taking back power. Mm -hmm. um, and it's gonna sound odd to say because athletes already kind of have a lot of power. Let's be honest mm -hmm. about that. <laughs> athletes have a lot of influence, but I mean it's more so like they're taking back their humanness. Um, because a lot of times as athletes and as um, we can be seen as like entertainers and people, and it's easy to forget that like we're people. Right. I mean, the, the issue becomes you like a set of expectations. So let's take a Simone Biles. 
of who's been great her entire career just does nothing but win. Right. So the expectation now is that you win at all at every event and everything that you do. So when you fall short from that from time to time, which we all do because we're human, then you can see the uproar or make a decision. But I think a lot of I think this is showing that no matter how great you are, how, how much no matter how much you succeed, you're still human at the end of the day and we all need a break. So I think you athletes are trying to take back their humanism. Mm. Do you feel like that I know you said it's a kind of a double sided sword we've talked about time. The idea of like players having their own podcasts and sharing kind of their struggles. Do you feel like the new media is a good thing for sports or a bad thing for sports? Because I feel like on the mental health side of things, it'd be good to talk about struggles. Mm-hmm. You know, you realize that these players aren't 100% confident in themselves all the time, mm-hmm. that they have those struggles. But, you know, it is kind of a thing where we're taking the power back so much that most of our media comes from the players themselves. So, what's your thoughts on that as a whole? I think the first thing is the new media is so funny to me because I really don't know what that means fully, <laughs> like the new media. Um, but I don't. I, I have no problems with the new media. I think it. I think the fans probably love it. And of course, it's another way of having revenue. But I think it's also a, a, a opportunity to get um, to cause still facilitate closeness with fans. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing, the only gripe I have with the new media that I don't think they're authentic all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and I don't really like the, the authenticity or the fakeness that comes across mm-hmm. sometimes. So I think if you're going to commit to it. Let's be be real. Um, don't like sugarcoat things. Mm. things like that. So you mean just like the stories that they tell in the podcast and things like that? Like yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is there a particular player you feel like does a good job with those podcasts in the NBA? Um, so I do. Um, and he's not playing the NBA now, and it's not just strictly to like sports related. Uh-huh. But if you ever watched um, Jeff Teague's podcast, like the Club Five Twenty, yeah, podcast, I've seen. It. I've seen clips. Well, Which clips are so big in pocket? Yeah. Have you seen JJ Redick as well? I, like, I have. I, I like JJ Redick. Redick, and I also think Draymond. See, Draymond is a straight shooter. I yeah. think. Now I'm not gonna lie. LeBron and Paul George, they be like <laughs> fabricating some things sometimes. But I still think as a whole, I think it's a good thing. You see, like someone like Mookie Betts in baseball, mm-hmm. football. You see, like Micah Parsons. Like it, I think the cool part about today's day and age is like you get to see that human side of the players. And I think that's a little different from what you know. I think someone like Kobe or Mike, you know what I mean? Like, obviously Michael Jordan did the last dance, but he's not doing podcasts. He's not doing no. interviews. Like, like Jerry West went on a Paul George podcast. But it's interesting, like, I feel like there's a kind of a riff there that some older people might not understand the concept of, like, who are like, why is Draymond going on his podcast after he lost the game? You know what I mean? It's interesting. Well, I think people just sometimes can get stuck in their ways, um, and everyone is stuck on like tradition and sometimes and when things are changing of course you always have detractors um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that something is, is wrong right uh, it's just about adapting with like the new times and this is just some of the new times we have to adapt to so you have a couple options you can fight change or you can accept it mm. so but doesn't mean change is not going to happen regardless yeah I, I honestly I, I like it because I think you get people interviewing people who understand where they're coming from, if that makes yeah. sense. Like, I know there's that meme of like Jeff Schwartz asking LeBron that question. He walks out with his short shorts, like he's said that. But in an all serious note, like some of the reporters, like it's like you got to tell me I played basketball. Yeah, you know, you're the same thing with the NFL. And I'm not saying you have to play the sports, but I think it gives an alternate angle that can be very interesting. Definitely, most definitely, I would agree. So another question I have, Demarion, tonight is you know we've kind of been using these words mental health and you know athletics, but you know just people who don't play sports as well. There's kind of a bit of buzzword of a mental health crisis or, you know, mental health problems in this country. So what do you think are some misconceptions people might have about this, like, buzzword mental health? Because that can mean a lot of different things. So for you, what do you think people don't understand about, you know, the mental health problems in our society today? I want to prepare for this question. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it was a good one. <laughs> it was a good question. So there's so many different avenues I can take. In this one, but I'll I'll I'll, pe- I'll try to keep it simple. Um, that I'll say I think the biggest misconception is that mental health can't affect someone, mm. um, or it can't affect um, an individual, or that everyone doesn't have to deal with or experience their own mental health. And I say that is because um, if I just think about some of the reactions that. Um, like family has, like you could say like parents or like you could say coaches in general, or you can even say some people who actually come receive mental health um, like services 
this sometimes it's this misconception or this myth that oh I didn't think that I could be affected by mental health you know it's like no like mental health doesn't have a certain look it doesn't have a certain identity it doesn't have a certain appearance like it can touch anyone at any given time um, so no one's exempt from mental health and what do you think are some factors uh, you know I've used this word crisis and I think you know there are so many people especially at the pandemic who are anxious and you know young people a little bit nervous about the future but where do you think we are in society and what do you think the factors are that have really driven up anxiety among young people? I mean, I'm sure if you look a hundred years ago that people aren't quite as anxious as they are today. I don't know if that's true or not, but I don't know, it just seems to me everyone I meet is so anxious about the future. What, what factors do you think lead to that? And what are some solutions people can do, maybe? Right. <laughs> I don't sound like an old man, but, <laughs> 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 uh, but I think one of the biggest things that has impacted it is like the influence of like social media. Um, and what I mean by that, like, you can access information so fast. Mm -hmm. And the one of the consequences of that and what has happened to our society is that it's so easy now to just spread information and it's not a lot of verification or verifying if that information is correct or not. You sometimes people just go with a headline and we'll think about the average social media user, how many people are clicking on that link to actually read the full article to go past the headline. I mean, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not doing it either. Doing it either. Uh, so I think a part of that, and then, so if you think about anything that gets pushed on social media, think about how many times um, something is pushed on social media, but we are, we have become a very skeptical society. Mm. Like no one believes anything. Bring in some philosophy to <laughs> the skeptics. Yeah, yeah, like no one believes anything anymore. Like every a lot of things have turned into it turned into a conspiracy. Mm. Um, so of course you're going to be anxious. If you never know what to believe. You don't know what's right. You don't know what's wrong. You don't know what's true. And then if we want to talk about the economy, you can talk about how everything's just becoming more and more expensive. So, right. <laughs> right. That's so, that's a that, that's a whole different can of worms yeah. for a for a different day. But um. I think one thing too, that's an interesting point you bring up about, you know, you can't trust anything. It's like, can I trust myself? Mm -hmm. Like, if I'm gonna be skeptical about everything, that means I'm gonna be skeptical about myself because you see people's highlights. It's like their highlight tape of their life. It's like, oh, look at all my friends, like this. But like, that might not be reality. Yeah. You know what I mean? And also you see the, the world's highlight tape that these people construct for you. It's like, you know, what sells? It's it's the negative things. It's the, the, the you know, coverage of war and the coverage of, you know, the pandemic, and obviously those things can be covered, but it's like, there's a lot of good things happening in the world, too. So it's like, sometimes, I don't know, I'll get caught up in my phone sometimes looking at this, like, debate, argument, and then I walk outside and the birds are chirping, and the sunshine, and, and I, I, you might disagree with this, but I'd say most people you come across are nice. It's like, there's something to human interaction on the internet when you're not seeing people face-to-face. -face. People are so cruel and mean, and I don't know, I, I'm going a little bit of a rant, but I feel like social media is probably a net negative right now in our society. Yeah. What would you say? I would say for the most part, and I think the, the you'll probably understand this one the best. I think the most prevalent app for that is Yik Yak. <laughs> like, we talked about that, you fans, like, we didn't have Yik Yak. And for those who don't know, I, I, I didn't take the time to explain this on Tuesday. I, it's Think about the worst aspects of social media. Combine them and times them times ten. Mm -hmm. That's Yik Yak. Mm -hmm. might, I, I've had professors say to go on there and like write stuff. Do, do you like this person's stuff? Uh, it's basically all anonymous, but... Mm -hmm. but that's a metaphor for the internet, kind of. It's all sort of anonymous. Oh, definitely. And uh, Yik Yak was around when I was in college. Um, and it was funny because the basketball team, we used to get killed on Yik Yak every day. <laughs> get killed on there every day. Some of it we probably deserve. <laughs> uh, so it's just like, if you think about uh, that on social media aspect of it, if you think about Instagram, you go to any of like, the blog pages, you'll see people that agree with it. And then you'll see people that's just like totally against it. So there's there on social media there's no the person with this is gonna sound bad, hopefully it doesn't come off as like disrespectful or anything like that. But it, the person that's in the middle ground doesn't get a lot of attention. You either no, have to be on fair. the extreme end on one side or the extreme in the other. Well even like someone posts like inspiration, someone's like clowning you for nothing. Or someone's like really supporting you. you know, so you have to have an extreme opinion to get like the recognition or yeah. the, um, it's almost like living in a black and white world. Yeah. Where a lot of our life is not actually right. black and white. And this is, I don't know if you've seen the movie, The Social Network. Mm -hmm. It's really kind of crazy, the psychology behind it. And like, the, if the people designed it, don't let their kids use it, you know, 
<coughs> I don't know. I think there's something really valuable about face to face interaction. But then I say this, and my mom just watches like funny dog and cat videos. Like, you know what I mean? So it's like, oh, like, like if you go with the mindset, I think it has some good uses too. Oh, yeah, definitely. You can does. be funny and stuff. Like, right. you know what I mean? But I don't know. I think you have to remember that there's a real world out there, and the internet's not everything. Oh, yeah. But I think that's definitely a challenge, especially for athletes. So you seem like somebody would say, oh, how do you have a burner account? Like, remember Kitty had that burner? But it's like, if people are slandering you on the internet every day saying you suck, you're terrible, mm-hmm. you're what they call a cupcake, like yeah, you're human. Yeah. Like I don't know. It would be hard, you know, to read those things. Back in the day you had like the headlines, too. You know, I did this was a podcast with Stephen A. Smith and um, it's interesting because I mean whatever your opinion is on him, he, he has worked hard to get where he's at. And mm-hmm. he's talking about it used to be just journal there was a you had to work hard and you were a columnist. There was a distinct group of journalists and columnists who got to have an opinion on sports and pretty much everything else too. You know, it's political columnists. Now anyone can have an opinion. Well, that's good or bad. It's just different. You know what I mean? It's like now everyone can have sports opinions on. And sometimes I'm like, this is the stupidest. I'm like, why? Why am I giving this person credit? You know what I mean? Like someone's like Dave's brother than Steph. I'm like, wow. Just type an idiot. And I'm like, no, no, no. Backspace. <laughs> just kidding. I don't do that. But you know what I mean? It's so funny how we get caught up in those things. Oh yeah, definitely. It's human nature to want to engage in conflict. <laughs> <laughs> now, for you, Demarion. You said the idea that, you know, your family, you know, might not know how to react if you come to them with these issues or if you're a friend. So kind of touched on this last time a little as well, but if I'm a friend of someone who says, you know, I'm not feeling well and I, I'm feeling down and, you know, I might be upset about this particular thing. This is a very uh, generalized question, I would say, but mm-hmm. as a friend, what's the best thing you can do to help someone who you think might be struggling? Like, what are some strategies you can use? I think the most important thing a friend can do, and it's going to sound so simple, but it's so powerful, is just being there. I think a lot of times as as, as people people we care about, we get really concerned of saying the right thing or being a fearful saying the wrong thing because we want to make sure that um, our friend is doing well and we don't want to see our friend struggle Mm -hmm. and things like that. But most of the time, the most important thing is just being there. Mm. And if you ask anybody who has been a struggle, um, who has struggled and overcome um, like their mental health issues and things like that, and you ask them what they remember from conversations about friends or family being there, the most most of the time they really won't even remember what they've ever said for them. The thing that will stand out to them is that, oh, I remember when I was down at this time, this person was there for me. They didn't say this person said this to me, but they say this person was there for me. So I think that the most important thing is just being there for that person and whatever that um, looks like and whatever capacity mm-hmm. that takes in and not necessarily getting caught up in it if I say the wrong thing or if I'm saying the right thing. It's just being there, that presence. Let them know that you're in that struggle with them and they don't have to have that struggle alone. So being there kind of means just being in the moment with that person. Mm-hmm. And just recognizing that they might be going through something. You know, just recognizing that they don't have to be in those feelings alone. Um, and that at a point in time, we all have feelings like that. And that they don't have to be um, embarrassed. They don't have to have, like, shame to be feeling this way. And that you're not going to look at them any different. Um, that we all have our moments where we just need a little bit of help. Mm-hmm. Um, and being there, I think, um, can can create that closeness mm-hmm. and, that, and that acceptance of that to make them want to continue kind of fight and things like that now did you find any particular strategies that i know we talked about last time your career with injuries and you had some mental health struggles like were there things off the court that you found that really helped you i know you said working out but any other strategies maybe strategies or activities that you use that you know felt like you could reach a better mental state by doing them um so do you mean like right now or when i was playing hmm how do you want to take it? Because <laughs> if you want to go when I was playing, I was the worst. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> um, my life was like the things that helped me was just always being in the gym, uh, shooting on the shoe machine, even though that was a double edged short because sometimes I would be mad if I was missing and be kicking balls around the court. But, <laughs> um, but now that um, I've transitioned outside of my playing career, it has been a lot of um, working out and actually appreciate things in a new way. Mm. Um, so, and it's like appreciating relationships. Uh, so I think on the last time I was here, I talked about my strength coach and how he, right. me and him was close. Um, he's the one who referred me to kind of go to counseling myself, but I think still off that me and him still cultivated relationships. So um, me and him play chess almost like everybody. Oh really? Day. Are you a good chess player? Uh, I'm okay. <laughs> 
I'm okay. <laughs> uh, but me and him play chess cool. about like every day. So trying to do things outside of that, spending time more of like my fr- like friends and things like that, not like isolated, not being so um, one tracked in my mindset. Um, and now still like like working out now, and now I'm a, a big reader. Where as in college. I was not a reader. Really? I did not know that. <laughs> so what kind of titles are you into? Um, so it's, it's kind of funny. Um, I only read books for therapy, actually. Um, wow, so some fun read. titles, right? <laughs> I don't really read for like pleasure or anything like that. I read more so because I feel like it, it helps the people oh. that I work with and be able to give them some information and knowledge and hear it in different ways that they may relate to it and things like that. So I think just being able to explore, try doing things outside of my comfort zone has helped me. Um, and continue to stay connected. And I think that staying connected is so difficult, especially transitioning to uh, after after college because the life transition outside of being an athlete can be very difficult. Right, and I, I wanted to, before you did that, I actually wanted to ask you a question about yeah. that. So the topic, is, you know, me as a senior, and we've had some several seniors on here, like there is this idea that and I've talked to some friends, you know, a kind of post-athletics depression, you know? Mm-hmm. And some people, you know, I think they have find success in finding competition. But for you, and just in general, how do you think people should deal with post? I would call it post athletics depression, kind of that grieving process of, you know, I'm done with my sport now. I've been playing since I was five, six years old. Now what? I think the first step is accepting accepting that grief um, and letting your process run its course, no matter what it looks like. <laughs> and then the biggest thing is going to be how can you rediscover yourself in a new way. Mm and find what your new purpose is. And then I think a lot of things that struggle, especially me, is that like, it's gonna sound crazy to say, but after you're done playing, even like society looks at you differently. Really, what do you mean by that? Uh, So if you think about, if you are an athlete, you walk around campus, think about how many people speak to you on campus, even if you know them or don't know them, strictly just because you're an athlete. But then when your playing career is over and you're just walking around in the world, think about how many people are going to speak to you. No, you're kind of just walking in. It's almost like you become invisible where you have used to like, you're seeing on campus people are at least, at least saying hi to you and things like that. Mm-hmm. So that changes. And then you have to, from a friendship standpoint, you're, let's say you're with your teammates, it doesn't take any effort to spend time with your teammates because you like, you see them all the time. Right. Kind of force me with them, right? <laughs> But then once you transition out of there, then you have to actually make an effort to make friends. And that's the difference space because like, oh, I've never had to make effort to make friends anyway because they just always have been my teammates. Um, so I think that's what I more so mean, like you get looked at differently and then it's mm-hmm. like, can you deal with that? And then can you, can you deal with like the, not having that competition aspect of it and then not, not being supported mm-hmm. and, and, that, and, and then being supported in a different way. It's a difference between getting supported from a, a whole arena and a whole gym than getting supported by just like a couple people here and there. Mm-hmm. So I think all those things are adjustments that we, we don't think about until like that ball or whatever the field or that football or whatever it is just stops bouncing for yourself. So that transition can be really difficult. That's why it's like first you have to accept that all this is happening. Um, and then to, okay, how can I find my purpose now in life? Like, what is what is my next stage of life? What this looks like? So I encourage people, use your sport. Don't let your sport use you. Mm. Great line. And also, uh, you're the big man on campus. People are saying hi to you just because I knew you from your sport. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like here, 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 I feel like everyone's an athlete. So everyone kind of knows everyone. But. No, but still speaking to everybody. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. Um... So don't let your sport use you, use your sport. Yeah. I think that's what a lot of people say sometimes, even after college, even if they're not an athlete, it's like, you know, that social aspect of it too. It's interesting. So do you still play any pickup basketball? I know you're playing in President Slam. <laughs> have you found competition in that way? I have, I actually do play in the rec league. Um, if I don't know if he's been on the show or not, but the assistant coach from the, the basketball team, Evan. Okay, no, he hasn't been on the show. Yeah, so me and we always, we play actually in the rec league from oh. time to time out in the like the grit league, that's what it's called. So I think we won it like two or three times. So okay, <laughs> we play that. But you're still looking for a dub in President Slam, right? I am. Oh, like oh and two, oh and three. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I'm looking for hopefully this year we can actually pull out a dub. 
I've actually been training for it this year. Okay, <laughs> nice. <laughs> awesome. And we talked about this last time, but who do you feel like who do you feel like as a player you based your game off? Like a player you really liked watching? Uh player that I like watch. Yeah, I don't think we brought up this last. Like it's someone you're like, this is my game right here, this guy. Uh so I got a compared. I don't know if you remember. I don't know if you remember this person or not. Uh, but I always used to get compared a lot to Lamar Odom. If you know who Lamar Odom is. Yeah, he played for the Lakers yeah. and the Trailblazers. I forget. I forget if he played with Trailblazers. Okay. But yeah, I know he played for the Lakers and it wasn't Chip. Yeah. So I always got compared to Lamar Odom because I used to be. I've always been tall, but I've always. I used to be like really, really skinny. Um, <laughs> top, and and people say like because I always had the ability to be able to dribble so I was like a point four and skinny and like that's how Lamar Odom is okay. so people everyone always say oh I play just like Lamar Odom and things like that so if you know Lamar Odom is that's what the, kind of the comparison that this guy sounds silly but did he hit a Kardashian too? he did yeah <laughs> <laughs> I know he had some problems off the course well, I watched that Malice the Palace documentary from, have you seen that documentary? I actually have but really? Uh, you should watch it. It's crazy. I mean, I'm sure you know the Malice of the Palace. Yeah, I was actually watching basketball at that time. I was like old enough to do it. Yeah, see, I was. <laughs> that was what 2002, one. I was young, so I. But that is, that is a crazy documentary. That that locker room with Steven Jackson, Rod Artest, and Jermaine. That that was yeah. that was some personality. <laughs> yeah, uh, Reggie Miller. Mm-hmm. But I guess the cool the well the interest not the cool part the interesting part of the argument is like. They probably won the championship. That's like what they said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they would have had a deep run. They had yeah, a good team. Can't believe everything you hear. <laughs> right. That's what's talking about Matthew B, right? The documentary. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it, but the interesting part was because I believe Ron Artest was on that team with Odom that won for the Lakers, right? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, but it's interesting. Like he got to go, but basically, I mean, Jermaine O'Neal's career kind of went downhill after the Dallas Palace. Yeah. I mean, he never had a ring. No, he never got the ring, but he definitely still had like the individual success, and right? Like that. But as far as the team success at that pace was going the deep run, I feel like people say a lot of crazy things when the cameras in their face. <laughs> that is true, though. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Um, so uh, listen, Mario, we got we got some fun questions here. So and then we'll get to some NBA talk. So we're talking about tournaments, some rec leagues, some things you play in. So from any person. Throughout NBA history, you can answer with this question. You're in a two-on-two tournament versus NBA greats. Who are you selecting as your teammate? KD. <laughs> really? No question. But what if you go against, like, Shaq? KD. <laughs> no question. <laughs> no question. See, everybody, if you might think I'm kind of wild for this. But from what we know, he was insane. Will. I'm going to say Will because I'm short. It's funny that you mentioned Will because I was talking to one of my old friends. I was like... I think Wilt was a myth. <laughs> like, well, they said he could lift more than Arnold. He could. Didn't he, like, play professional soccer, professional volleyball? Like, he could, like, sprint, like, faster than Pele or something like that. I don't know. I don't know. like, you're on the mythical thing. Like, yeah. It's about 100 points he gave. There's no video. There's video of, like, Babe Ruth hitting a baseball, but there's no video of Wilt Chamberlain scoring in the 100-point game. So his just tail just keeps growing and growing. You think it's a myth? I don't know. You think he scored 100, do you think he scored 100 a game? I, I do say I will say he scored 100 a game. I will go. But like all that stuff about like him lifting, but I'm like, game draft. It's hard for me to believe. It. Like, <laughs> like, like come on, they're, they're like he's the yeah. best human ever. Like, yeah, I, I don't know about that. The best <laughs> human ever. But, yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's stuff off the court, right? But, yeah. <laughs> oh, <no>. but <laughs> I, I would say Will, because I, I would want to say like Steph or someone like that. But like you're gonna need a rebounder at two on two all time greats. Yeah. But I will KD because KD can literally do everything. He can he rebound, can. yeah. He can like, I would say Mike or Kobe because, like, they just wouldn't lose, right? But yeah. but KD's like seven foot can do everything they can do. He can. Play. Yeah, he can. Hopefully he doesn't leave your team. But. <laughs> Start losing, so. Right. <laughs> I, know, I know you're so, – so how do you feel about KD as a son? Like, you see, like – like, that's interesting because, like, is LeBron thought of his all-time great Laker? Like, should he be included with, like, you know, names, like, obviously Will played for the 76ers, but, like, you know, should be included with, like, Will, Magic, Kobe, is KD, like, guys who just play for, you know, how are those guys remembered, do you think? Those are two kind of different examples, yeah. but. I think KD is just going to be more known as a great player, more than being known for a great, like, player for Because he is, he, he's not a warrior. Yeah. If anyone, he could probably be OKC. Yeah, maybe with the Thunder, but yeah. I think more for the Sun. The crazy thing about it is, 
I think LeBron has changed the perception of the game so much that we don't realize KD's like in his like 16 for like he's in, yeah he's been in the league. We can all tell time. His, his, his hair is going back, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> like if you think about like the history of the league, typically people are like in how long has KD been in the league? They start to be on the decline. Right. Like, KD still like averaging like and with an Achilles injury or twenty. Yeah, yeah, but he's still averaging yeah. 27, 28. Like he, it's just like, it's just crazy to, to think about it, the way he's still doing um, at this at his age and things like that. I think that just speaks how that's why I would take him to him too. Yeah, <laughs> no, that is a good point, and he can do everything. It's also like I'm thinking about two K blacktop now. Have you ever played Friends Like Blacktop two on two? Um, this is a classic question you see thrown around social media all the time. So I was looking at some of your stats, so I was trying to guess what you'd pick here. Twenty thousand dollars for a layup, you get one shot. Fifty thousand dollars for a free throw, seventy-five k straight on three, or a corner three for a hundred k. What you taking? Say again. So twenty-five k for a layup, fifty k for a free throw, seventy-five k three straight on, hundred k corner three, NBA three point line. Oh, I wouldn't take a layup for twenty-five thousand. I'm a short. I'm a short. I'm a short guy. Is that more the free throw? I'm gonna get the easy twenty-five thousand. <laughs> <laughs> Why stress myself out or? Confirm, I know this, this layup is the easiest shot in the game. Right. <laughs> just don't miss the layup, right? Yeah. <laughs> and even that, I can just dunk it. So. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair question for you. See, I can't dunk, so. Uh, why, why risk it? I know I can get this for sure 20 miles. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot you can dunk. Oh, man. Well, all right, Demar, let's get into some NBA here. So, we've got an interesting situation in the West. There is some teams in the play-in. Who we've thought, you know, as great teams over the years, you got the Lakers, the Suns, the Warriors, you get the Kings and Mavericks, all kind of around that play position. The Suns are actually out of the play. They're up right now in the sixth seed. So for you, Demario, which of those teams, without bias, <laughs> obviously you said Suns and Six last time on here, right? But which of those teams do you think can make the most noise in the playoffs? Or you want the West, just the West? Just those, just out of those five teams. Kings, Mavericks, Warriors, Lakers, Suns. Those kind of bubble playing teams. All right. So, you, it's, I promise you it's not biased. <laughs> I promise you it's not biased. But I will say the Suns, um, strictly, <laughs> strictly could I think the combination of Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, and Bradley Beal is definitely dangerous compared to those teams. I think it, when it comes to the Suns, it's all going to be about um, – when the game slows down, or they're going to rely on just trying to one-on-one isolations, where they, they can definitely get you beat. Yeah. Um, but also, it's going to come down to health. Um, or are we going to be That's healthy enough? Yeah. Like, are we going to be healthy enough to even have our all our pieces um, for the for the uh, playoffs? Because we also have some complimentary pieces like Grayson Allen, who's like Duke legend, really <laughs> like three-point shooting. Yes. Um, and then like we just traded for Royce O'Neal, who's been like a good fit and things like that. Um, so I, I think combination like Katie Devin Booker and Bradley Beal is kind of um, I just trust that more because I think the Lakers of course you just LeBron and AD but I mean Tennessee LeBron still is in like year 21 he has, yeah. to, be, he has to be human at some point yeah he's <laughs> I'm surprised so so I would say either the Suns or the Warriors the Kings the Kings are sneaky but I said the Warriors young talent has really helped mm-hmm. elevate and take the pressure off Steph and uh, Clay, to a certain extent, I think Clay can more, play more free when Kevin is attacking. They they have the I think the opposite issue of the Suns. They got to see if their young guys can perform. You know, the Suns have the guys who have been there. Mm-hmm. That'll be interesting, though. It, it's almost interesting that you know why does you know or should anyone want to get that sixth seed and have to play the Nuggets? You know what I mean? Right now, that'd be interesting. That's a tough first round matchup. Well, the Nuggets. Uh, the one seed will play the who? What's the seed of the Nuggets? Nuggets are three right now. Oh, Nuggets are three. Yeah. We're well, we all hope the Nuggets go up. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so you have the Thunder, up. too, also been played. Shea is probably second in MVP mm-hmm. uh, voting when he fills my eyes right now. The Timberwolves are number one. But like you said, Cat just got, got hurt. Cat just got That's hurt. That's big. So Denver might move up in the standards. Minnesota might slide down yeah. the standards a little bit. Anthony Edwards started out really hot, too. He's kind of cooled down a little bit. But he hit, the start of the season, he was – he's bought it. Team USA helped him out a lot this summer. But – what makes the, you know, we're all talking about 
these different teams, but the Nuggets are still a team to beat, right? In many people's minds, they won last year. What makes the Nuggets scheme so successful? Besides the big Serbian dude. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is the way that they play the game of basketball. I think it's different than a lot of the other teams in the NBA. Um, so if you see the Nuggets, although they do some pick and roll from time to time, excuse me, their offense is not predicated on that. So if you watch a lot of the other teams outside of like the Warriors, um, a lot of their ball movement, probably the Celtics as well, um, a lot of their um, play style is like pick and roll, let's try to get a mismatch, then go one on one. Um, where that's not the way Denver plays. Denver plays a lot of cutting, a lot of pace, um, a lot of passing cutting and cutting through the lane and then playing through the post or playing through Jokic. Um, and they really only go to that two main game, that pick and roll with with Jamal Murray and Jokic. Which is, a, really, which is a pretty good <laughs> game. But they really only do that in like really crucial moments of the game. Right. Um, and then of course, I think Jokic just has his such ability his imprint is on the game in so many different areas, so he just controls the game. He's playing, he's playing the the mental side of the game, the IQ side of the game at all times. Um, so I think that's what makes the Nuggets like differently. Um, different. They just have a different play style than a lot of like the NBA, where they're more passing, cutting, moving without the ball, and then sharing the ball and things like mm. that. Now let's talk about the Eastern Conference. Now, do you think this is the year, Marion, that the Celtics? Finally get the job done. They finally get that ring. Now, talk about players not being honest to interviews. Jalen Brown, a couple years back, I don't know if you know this, but Malika Andrews, he said he's going to win like five rings in the next seven years. So he's got to do that very, very quickly. But, and Jason Tatum also said Malika Andrews this year. Something about her, I don't know why players make up so much stuff when she's interviewing him. But he said he's the best player in the NBA right now. So a lot of talk coming from the Celtics. Do you think they can do it? I don't know if I'll give them that they can that they'll win it all, but I definitely will pick them to win in the East. I think it, as a team they're just so deep, um, and I think they I don't think they really have any weaknesses. Um, I think anything that a team that you want out of a team, I think the the Celtics have. If you want to talk about from Drew Holiday to Derek White to Jason Taylor to Jalen Brown to Porzingis, but you still want to talk about the bench, then they got Peyton Pritchard coming off the bench. They got Al Horford coming off the bench. Yeah. They got Sam Howser coming off the bench. So they have a lot. Of, they have shooting. They have drivers. They have defenders. That's right. I mean, they basically got Porzingis for. <laughs> so I think uh, they're probably the the most complete team right. in the NBA. So I definitely will pick them coming out the East, especially with the injuries to like Joel Embiid and the up and down and inconsistency of a little bit of Milwaukee. Uh, right. Like that. So yeah, I'd be interested to see if Doc Rivers, what his tenure is remembered as in Milwaukee. Right. I feel like you could go either way. Because obviously they start off really cold, mm-hmm. but they've won six of the All-Star game. Obviously the Warriors put an end to that. But um, – <laughs> Do you see Dame's comments about how he's like bored in Milwaukee? Did you see that? Mm-hmm. He's like, I just go home and play video games. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like that was kind of detrimental to the team. Like, why would you say that? I don't know. Maybe that's right. Okay. See, NBA, I see it. There are things I think people like, NBA players live a different lifestyle than we do, right? What they do on an everyday basis, like yeah. the restaurants they eat at, the clubs, and all that stuff. But, like, I think you really want to go to Miami. Mm-hmm. I think, <laughs> I think what's hard is that it's really hard. It's really hard to have sympathy for millionaires. <laughs> exactly. It's like I just, he said. He said I just go to work, eat dinner, go home, play video games. Like that's not enough. Like that's not what ninety percent of people would love to do. And get big millions of dollars to do it, right? Well, I think that really, it's really hard to have sympathy for millionaires. But I think it goes back to the conversation about trying to show and express our humanness. Yeah. Um, is that he's going through like like a lot of off the court issues, like just right. got traded, moved his family, been in Portland for his whole life, so a right. lot of his life was in Portland. He had his own specific routine in Portland, knew exactly all the places. So when you go to a whole other whole other place, moved essentially on the whole other side of the country, yeah. um, that's co- of course going to be an adjustment. I mean, when you have the money, it's going to be a little bit better of an adjustment. I mean, I'm, he still has a mansion. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and it's just, I think it's a combination. It's hard to feel sympathy or empathy uh, for millionaires. <laughs> But at the end of the day, they're still humans right. at the end of the day. And, of course, they're going to still have their, their, um, their struggles. <laughs> now, outside of those two teams, you know, the top two teams in the East, yeah. you know, who do you feel like is a dark horse team can make a run? There's a lot of teams that kind of float around. You get teams like the Knicks, the Cavs, mm-hmm. you know, honestly, someone like the Pacers. You got Therese Halliburton. Who is that guy who can put you on his back at times? 
So who's the Dark Horse team in the uh, East for you? I would say probably it's either between the Cavs and the Knicks. The Knicks, yeah. Because the Cavs, I think that if I remember correctly, the Cavs have like the best record in the NBA since like a couple, I can't, I can't forget the specific month, but I think they've had the best record in the NBA staying back like before the all start, uh, break started. Um, so I think they just have a lot of pieces, and Max Struess is the funny thing about it. My last collegiate game was actually against Max Struess at DePaul. <laughs> I think he had like 40. <laughs> really? Well, that's crazy. Like, because he's, he's tall, isn't he? He's like 6'6", yeah, 6'7". Like six, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I, he played some big minutes for the Heat in the finals. Yeah, I mean, speaking of the Heat, though, leads me to say, I feel like the Heat, you can't count him out. You can't, you know, you got the whole playoff Jimmy, yeah. Jimmy identity. He's like, seems like he'd be such a cool dude to hang out with for a day. It would like, definitely be interesting. Yeah, he's, interesting. A, he's always like, uh, he's like a huge like, country music fan. He's always just like Nickelback, but well, not really country, but Nickelback, <laughs> like Hootie and the Blowfish, like, seems like an interesting guy. He's a very interesting guy. They got traded for Terry Rozier, um, Ohio native, going it out there. Oh, really? <laughs> Ohio native. <laughs> Uh, so the Heat is definitely a team you always have to watch out for. Well, be, I think it's going to be cool to see some new teams that really haven't been in the playoff mix in a while, like the Pacers and like the uh, Magic. Yeah. Uh, the or- Orlando Magic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big Paulo fan when he's a dude. He's mm-hmm. he's a certified bucket. But we'll see what happens. I mean, I, I agree with you that the Celtics are kind of that team right now that's dominant. And like, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see if the Celtics don't win it this year, how Jason Tatum's legacy is affected. I know we're really talking about legacy and stuff, but like, I feel like he did not play his best ball against the Warriors. You know what I mean? Obviously, like, I mean, I'm a Warriors fan. I think that that was the Celtics series to win. They were up, obviously, two games to one. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think for I think from the public perception that I think everyone knew like the Warriors had the the experience, right? Um, and that the experience would eventually like take over um, in that aspect. So it wasn't a surprise to me that even though. They got up 2-1. Maybe it's that thing you doubt your own team. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, we'll see. I, think, I think Tatum will probably get a ring. But will it be we'll this see. year? We'll see. I, I probably wouldn't say this year. I wouldn't actually go this year. So here's your, your finals prediction this year. Celtics and? If I had to, I, I would probably give it to the Nuggets to go back. But I, the sleeper in the West to me is the Clippers. Ah, but they're the Clippers, though. They're the Clippers. But when you, when you throw out James Harden, Kawhi Leonard, and Paul George, <laughs> that's a very good three to have. So we'll see. That's that's my sleeper. That's my sleeper team in the West. If they can stay healthy. If they can stay healthy. But they've been healthy this year. They have. Knock on wood, right? Yeah, so. I mean, you'd love to see them at full strength. And I think the interesting thing is, too, it's like they never been to, the franchise has never been to NBA Finals. No. Oh. But they get picked almost every year to be up there. Well, so we're going to see. We're gonna, that's my sleeper. And then I'm, you, hopefully this is going to reverse psychology for the Suns. Like <laughs> it's going to be that 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 Western Conference play is going to be – it's going to be sad because you want to see all this play. But I like the play in, though. I like the play in. I'm not sure about the in-season tournament. I'm not sure. I'm not too sure about the play in either. <laughs> oh, really? Why not, why not like the play in? Because I'm like, if you're the tip seed, like, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it more A. Like, well, you know what's really about more dollars. Yeah, like, well, we're not, but come on, we're the Tennessee. Like, let's go to Cancun. <laughs> like, nah. Like, so you're mad because you, know, you want the Suns to be in, right? Like, let's go to Cancun. <laughs> like, Why are we going to reward the Tennessee with a chance to make the playoffs if they were terrible now? I, th- I think it keeps fans more interested, though. Well, like, like, it makes it more exciting. Like, like, why are we going to reward the tip seed? Like, you were terrible the whole season, and you're just going back. But the Lakers and the Warriors are above 500, though. Ah, you know what I'm saying? But it's not it's not like the, the most teams over five hundred, it's like the best eight teams. <laughs> I, I like it. I like it. I think it keeps things interesting. It does, it does. And it keeps you on your toes. But then you know they're probably gonna try to expand the play in one day. That'd probably be all fifteen teams, right? right. You can see what they're doing in college football, they're expanding the playoffs. So okay, here's my well, well maybe we'll get to this at the break. We'll wrap up our, our NBA discussion. Uh that we'll call a little football as well. Um Let's see what else we got here. Yeah, it's a good question we'll end on the segment four. Who's more likely to win one more ring? KD, Steph, or Braun? KD, Steph, LeBron. We have our favorite players. The audience knows who our favorite players are. I don't think it's LeBron. I definitely don't think it's Steph. 
Really? <laughs> that was the biggest step. <laughs> I don't. I don't think it's. I don't think it's LeBron because I think process of elimination. Okay, it's KD. <laughs> it's KD. It's KD. Yes, sir. It's KD. <laughs> process of elimination. Let's go, KD. See, I LeBron. You put LeBron, LeBron last. No, I got LeBron second. <laughs> so you have no faith in Steph. I'm sorry to say this to you, but I think it's the demise of the Warriors. <laughs> so, Even with the young guys. I think it's over for the Warriors. I really do. And that's what they said last time, too, right? In 2022. They did. We did say that. Yeah. We did say that. But I, I think it's about it's over. I think it's All, only time will tell, right? Uh, but uh, this is Katie. Let's go, Katie. His, his supporting cast is better than LeBron's supporting cast. Oh, that's... And it's definitely better than Steph's supporting cast. Yeah, that's fair. So... And Katie still playing at elite level himself. So, Katie. We'll, we'll see what happens. So, if the playoffs are today, they would play the Nuggets first round. So, that'd be a tough matchup. Yeah. You think how many more years does Katie have, too? That's true. I would definitely be scared. <laughs> of the Nuggets. So, I mean, the Clippers are 2.5 games back. Nuggets and the, t- the Thunder. Like, we haven't really talked about them tonight, but Shea? He's that guy. Yeah, I think what it is is. I think it was, it's been good for college, not college basketball today, <laughs> is that it's been a movement away from the super teams. I agree. That's what the uh, super team era is over. Yeah, and it's just more team-oriented basketball. And if you think about that, Thunder, they have a lot of young guys. They all play all or play together. They got the superstar in Shea, and then they just traded for Gordon Hayward. Yeah. Um, which has been a solid piece, but he can never stay healthy. Right, yeah. He might not um, even play that much. Yeah, but they um, got hype with Chad, and Ch- Chad's been really good for his yeah. quote-unquote rookie year. Yeah, you got Josh, <laughs> Josh Giddy in there, too. Yeah. No comment on Josh. <laughs> 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 but, yeah. uh, but they got a lot of shooting with like Isaiah Joe coming off the bench and things like that. So the Thunder's have a really good team. They have defense and like Lou Dort. Um, so I think they're just a young up and coming team, and they're probably they're probably one more piece away. Um, but I mean, in the NBA, anything can happen with like injuries, and who knows what happens? Yeah, they end up in the finals and things like that. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. It's definitely going to be. And she played because I mean we didn't even talk about the Pelicans like it's there's there's a lot of teams there that have potential. I mean I think a team like the Mavericks is probably not gonna but even they have Luca you know yeah, what I mean. They got the firepower with Luca and Kyrie. Yeah, that's we'll see what happens. Like, someone said on Twitter, wait till the because uh, Luca was looking mad. You saw like how much Luca and Yogi trade out in the All Star game. Wait till those two team up. Mm-hmm. It's over for the league. <laughs> but all right, Mar, we got our trivia question tonight before we go to break here and I'm going to ask you a trivia question of course you have time to you know think about it during the break and your trivia question for tonight is who was the first teenager in NBA history to score 20 plus points in 10 consecutive games was it A. Luka B. Zion C. Kobe or D. LeBron, we'll get your answer after the break. This is the President's with Sam Strutt, 9.7 FM, WNJR Washington, online at WNJR.org. Like with sports like basketball or football, there's so much trivia. Like it's a little like tougher when it's like uh, water polo or field hockey or something like that. Like more of an Olympic sport. Mm-hmm. So I come with like the international trivia and stuff like that. What did I ask you, Faye, one Tuesday overnight? Ask oh, about Liverpool. He's a big uh, Premier League. You, I'm not a big soccer fan. Nah, no, only only during the Olympics. <laughs> all right, all right, Team USA. Yeah, the World Cup name. Right. 
USA Basketball, LeBron's getting the Avengers together for they next need, They need it. They do need it. <laughs> World's about to pass the USA for good, I think. The funny thing about it, I was talking to my friends like this. Why does no one address that Kawhi Leonard has never played for Team USA? Because it's Kawhi. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's no expectation for Kawhi to just not play. Like, no one even talks about it. Yeah, people talk about Steph, LeBron, KD. Yeah, no one just, everybody just assumes Kawhi's not playing. No one brings it up or anything. Like, why is he the one superstar just now that doesn't have to play? This personality, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no that's, that's actually a great point. Wait, no one talks about Kawhi just never playing for Team USA. Is he, he's never played for Team USA? I don't think he's ever played for Team USA. And he almost like to the end of his career. That's crazy. I just don't, or I can't remember it. Well, it's Joel Embiid's playing for Team USA, right? Yes, but he's technically from Cameroon. Yeah, but he, he decided. So he could play for Cameroon. He wasn't going to play for um, France. He had to choose because he has citizenship in France as well. So, so he, he lived in France. I, I forget, about, but he it came down to him playing for France for the USA. Oh, okay, France is pretty stacked too. He came down and played for USA. Even pa- uh, Paolo, he he came to like play for USA or or uh, Italy. Paulo, was he born? Yeah. Was his dad in the military? I think his mom's from, I think his mom's Italian or something oh, okay. like that. And he chose to play with Team USA. And then, of course, the Italians were mad about that. Yeah. This is European. Well, I saw a thing Coach Cal Perry talking about. It's like, they, they practice the fundamentals. They play, like, practice a lot more than they play. Yeah. They system. It's kind of like that way in baseball here, honestly. It's like, everyone's playing so much, you don't practice. You know, mm-hmm. showcases and stuff. Mm-hmm. That's the best players right now are European, in my opinion. If you, yep. the, if you look at the MVP, the MVP vote every yeah. year. Giannis, Jokic, Shea. Shea. Giannis, he's Canadian. Giannis yeah. is always Giannis, Jokic, and B. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, and, I, I can't. And Luka. And Luka. I can't and yeah, I can't stand Giannis the way he plays, though. <laughs> he's so, I feel like he's so bagless. He has no bag. He just goes out, uh, gets stopped by the wall, comes out, dribbles again. Like, uh, yeah, man, he's got like a lot. to say that you'll have a bag when you average 30. <laughs> But you saw what Hard said though. You saw what Hard said. He was like, it's not hard to run a dunk. <laughs> when they average the same amount of points, it's hard and hard. And one's a champion and one's not. That's true. <laughs> it's hard to say. Well, that's like people who say Joel and B gets fouled too. Like that's part of his bag. Yeah, so, I don't know. Hard got a bag, but Hard also is known for not to show up in big games. So yeah. do you want the bag or you want the success? <laughs> See, I'm not a fan of Hard. I'm not a fan of Hard either, but at least Jokic, like, he'll, but, but honestly, I'm not, I don't know, sometimes I find it hard to watch Jokic play, like, he's just, three dribbles, pass, like. Do you want it to look good, or do you want the results? I'm going to prefer this, that, to me, that's the, uh, that's what I will say about the Warriors, like, there's something aesthetically beautiful about their basketball, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's true. I'll give you that one. It was kind of like when they played when they played in um, 2016 when when the Rockets missed all those threes. Mm-hmm. I mean that was like the two styles, like you know what I mean the ISO ball. I think James Harden is passing a lot more now though. Yeah, over later stages of his career, no, not explosives anymore, but yeah, you know, sacrificing when you got Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so. uh, it's like the Clippers every year though. It's like everyone's watching over the Clippers and then. I just knew they were going with ring one of these years. I don't think so. When Kawhi Bulgers first initially went to the Clippers, I for sure thought they were going to win at least. Really? One. See, it's the Clippers are going to be the Clippers. You know what I mean? I think until they prove me wrong, you know? It's like the Cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> I do like Dak, though. I do like Dak. But yeah. their fans are so toxic. Yeah. And Jerry Jones. I don't like Jerry Jones. It's one of theirs. But do you see that they said they didn't draft Travis Kelsey because of red flag? Do you see that today? Yeah, we just smoking weed. Now we just made the illegal NFL. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Travis Kelsey, he's a character. Character, uh, man. He's impressive. Yeah, he's good. Yeah. I mean, they have some dudes on that cheat. Isaiah Pacheco. I like watching him play. He runs angry. <laughs> he's another Ohioer. Oh, really? Travis Kelsey. Travis, yeah, and his brother went to Cincinnati. Yeah, from, yeah. from Cleveland. Really? Yeah. Also, Jake Paul, Logan Paul, right? You see Jake Paul's fighting um, Mike Tyson? Yeah. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, Grab some money when you can. Thanks. I mean, come on, <laughs> get the bag, right? <laughs> it's all making a bag, no. I mean, that's a, I mean, you can say you fought Mike Tyson. Ow. How many people can say that? Yeah. And love to tell the tale, right? <laughs> if you're a sport, you fought a legend in your sport. Yeah.
USC 91.75 WJR Washington, a lot of WNJR or hope everyone is doing well on this Thursday night. You listen to the present dance with Sam Stewart right here on WJR. Today we're talking with WJ counselor Demarion Jeter. And before the break, we asked Demarion his trivia question, and it is Who was the first teenager in NBA history to score 20 plus points in 10 consecutive games? Was it A. Luca, B. Zion, C. Kobe, or D. LeBron? Tough question. I don't think it was Kobe because Kobe didn't play for a couple years in the league when he first got into the league. I don't know if Zion got that, but I know it's either between LeBron or Luca. But final answer, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go LeBron. I'm gonna go LeBron. That is incorrect. It's actually Zion. <laughs> so in the, if you do remember this, it's a, it's a brief period of time, and everyone's kind of brain is wiped out after COVID. You know, I mean that the whole period seems like a blur. But in 2019, 2020 season. Zion was hurt to start his career. In the 13 games between the injury and the COVID stoppage, he averaged 20 plus points per game. Huh. Are some doing yeah, he's he's good, but I mean, talk about a guy who's got to got to figure some things out or off the court, and, you know, <laughs> get get his mind right, focused. Mm-hmm. But hopefully, he can he can put it together at some point. Oh, yeah. We'll see. Um, now. Tomorrow, you mentioned the college football playoff. We haven't talked about this much on here. What's your thoughts on that? You, you kind of rolled your eyes when you said it. <sighs> I, I, I hate to be a cynic. Be that. Not, you're not. You're, hey, this is sports talk. I, go, go, go for it. I'm a controversial figure. <laughs> but it, it really is all. It really is about the money. It really is. Because at the end of the day, even when they, before they even expanded to the playoff, the same teams were in the national championship. Every That's year what anyway. I always say. It's like <laughs> it's not going to be like March Madness. No, like football is drastically different. Like, of course, you'll get the every once in a while when Appalachian State beat Michigan, but like that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen in a playoff game. Like, even when they went originally to the playoff, like it's been a, a top tier SEC team in the championship yep. every year. Yep, and they kill whoever is in the, the first. The first semifinal. Well, they'll put like a like a four in there, and like, like yeah, and like Georgia or Alabama, right? Pretty consistently, one that you I mean you had the one year with, with LSU, but again another dominant yeah. SEC team. So to me, it's just well, like, Michigan uh, made, but Michigan's a powerhouse. Like, yeah, like so. Here's my thing: is like, and I'm well, I wasn't really watching football in these days. I guess I was like, but I heard an interesting point on podcast. Like, college football didn't used to be about a national champion. It's not a pro sport. It's not about the champion. It's about there's bowl games. Like people watch the Rose Bowl. People watch the Tostitos Bowl or whatever, the Mayo Bowl. Or what's that one man, the Pop Tart who got cooked? You saw? Yeah. Like, that, you know, some of those are good games still, but like, a lot of people aren't playing those now. It's like there's no meaning behind it. It's like, if you're not in the tournament, it doesn't matter. Like, to me, I used to love bowl season, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm not saying I'm not like a cynic saying you can't enjoy it anymore, but it's like, it's different now, you know? Oh, um, most definitely is. And I think uh, it's a combination of things, uh, especially like what's the <coughs> like what's the incentive for a player to play in a bowl game now? Like, especially if nothing. you want to get, especially if you want, think you want to go to the NFL, like you can spend that month training. Right, and, so, and not getting training. hurt. Not but you can't get hurt training. But you can get hurt training. And so it all comes down to that balance of, What's the love for your sport? Like doing that one last time for your with your teammates and um, things like that. Versus like, okay, what can I do the best for me? And everyone has their own um, value system and belief system when it comes down to that. But I think the initiation of the playoff kind of unfortunately took away some of the prowess of the other bowls because if it's not like the playoff, then you're kind of like chopped liver um, almost. <laughs> yeah, and like I. And the, the cool thing is, like, I saw a certain, like, I, you know, I was watching Duke that if, but a few guys transferring and still playing, but there's certain guys who are transferring and, like, you know, they're not going to play the bowl game because they're going to another school. Mm-hmm. And, like, here's the thing, too, is, like, it's going to be the same four schools even if it's 12. <laughs> like, you're like, oh, Tulane would have played Alabama this year. What would have happened if Tulane? We all know what happened. <laughs> like, <laughs> stop act, like, stop acting like. I mean, I, you know, I love the American Conference. You know, my dad's on modern's in there. You know, DC. You know, I like to see like a Cincinnati. To, if it's, like, the year uh, UCF was good, mm-hmm. so they would have UCF would have played Bama. Yeah. Like, what would have happened? Now they did beat now they did beat Auburn. So things can't happen. But <laughs> I think you know, what I mean, it's like well, I like the four. Yeah. Because Florida State, my opinion on that is like there's actually a rule in the bylaws that depends on the health of your team for voting processes. Like you saw what happened in the bowl game, so. 
Yeah, I didn't really feel bad for Flores. No, I didn't feel bad uh, I think, unfortunately, sports is not a, a, a um, do the, do the, um, can't think of the word I want. It's not a Disney movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, sports is a reality business, a reality situation. The quarterback is the most important position of a football team, especially the offense. So if you lose your Heisman candidate quarterback, you're going to be a different team. Right. Um, and you had two or three games afterwards, and I forget, they don't, like they played Louisville in the ACC championship. No one by much, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it's like, how, how are you going to leave Alabama out? Right. And they just beat Georgia. Who's the, if you want to be really honest, Georgia probably should have been in too. Because <laughs> they were the, the back, back national champions and didn't even get the chance. But that's the problem with having a national. It shouldn't just be the one and two, right? Yeah, so... It was, it was interesting, all the, the uproar that came out of Florida State, and they were trying to sue, don't know particularly they want to sue for it. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, like, it's crazy, man, yeah. it's crazy. Now, it's funny, because Jim Harbaugh in that national championship said deuces to the NCAA. Do you think he'll have success in the NFL? Oh, I do. I, do. I think he will, too, yeah, just because he's been successful at places. Yeah, he's been successful in the NFL before. I mean, yeah. He'd been to the Super Bowl with the 49ers when he had Colin Kaepernick as his quarterback. And so he, no, I'm sorry, man. John Harbaugh, I'm sorry. John no. Harbaugh's going to the chart. Or did I misspeak? Who did I say? <laughs> I got confused. To Jim coaches for the Ravens. I thought John coaches for the Ravens. No, that's Jim. Which one? No, that's John. So I'm sorry. You're right. John coaches for the Ravens. <laughs> okay. No, Jim, no, Jim was already in the NFL previously. Right, right. Yeah, so okay. Yeah. I got confused there. You confused me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about and her dad was a coach, too. Their dad was a coach in the NFL. Yeah. They're a family of coaches. So yeah. So he's, he's, had, he's had success in the NFL before and at the highest level, so he just didn't win it, but. I definitely think he can get back. You know, he will have Justin Herbert as his quarterback, so that's a good one exactly. to have. So, way too early Super Bowl prediction for next year. I know you're a huge NFL fan. Did you ever play football? No. I actually did. I played Pee Wee football. Oh, really? Uh, Were you a wide receiver? No, I actually was a quarterback. Uh, but I stopped playing around like fifth or sixth grade because I was, I've always been tall mm-hmm. and then I was skinny. Um, and then you realize when you're that age, um, parents don't show you a lot of sympathy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they show you a lot of sympathy. So when I would play games, at first people always, since I was taller than anyone, I would always have to get my birth certificate checked before games to make sure I was of age. But then when we was running on the sidelines, you'll see me like with the ball running, all you hear is a pair of screaming, Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! So I was like, yeah. And then as I was getting older, of course, other people started getting older and bigger. And I was like, yeah, playing quarterback, I don't want to keep getting hit. So let's go hoop. Footballs, yeah. Well, I see like, like WMJ, like, I'll be standing on the sideline, I'd be a ball boy, and, like paint goes flying off the helmet. So I'm just, yeah. okay. <laughs> let's go. Hoop. Yeah, let's go, hoop, right? <laughs> so, but I know you're still a big football fan. So, can we go against the Chiefs? That's really the question. You really can't go against the Chiefs, but I can't. I can't. I don't think they can do a three peat. Like, well, I don't know the last time a team has ever three peated, or if someone's ever three peated. That's a good trivia question. Mm-hmm. Let me look it up real quick. But I do think the 49ers are going to get better. Because I think they're getting a new defensive coordinator. That's going to be helpful. That will be helpful, but I'm not going to blame the Super Bowl for the defensive coordinator. It was that office that didn't show up. It was, I, I think both parts are equally to blame. But I think the defense, sitting back in overtime, letting Mahomes all out blitz man coverage, letting him pick you apart like that while you're sitting back. Well, Me and Kyle Shanahan called a timeout because he saw Steve Wilkes was doing that. And he goes, and you don't see that. You, you probably flip the channel over to defense. So what are you guys doing? Well, but then you still, if you said that, then you have to point out that Kyle shot and took the ball in overtime, and he shouldn't have took the ball in overtime. Well, <laughs> I, well, I think that's him for not explaining the rules. <laughs> no, I, I definitely agree with both of them. But I think I think they do get better by – well, it's interesting they offered Spagnuolo the job. Did you see that? They offered yeah. the Chiefs defensive coordinator. Yeah. But I think at the end of the day, it was the, the Chiefs defense making those big stops. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Or the 49ers didn't get the stop. But it, you're also going to ask Mahomes. But they didn't know the rules of the overtime. And that's Kyle Shanahan's fault. Job. <laughs> I agree. That is his fault. That is his fault. That is his fault. And the, the whole difference is Steve Wilkes, is, they hired a defensive coordinator that didn't have the, didn't share the same philosophy they did. So if you paid attention to Carolina, right. Steve Wilkes, when he led that, and when he was the interim coach there, he blitzed a lot. But Kyle Shanahan doesn't really believe in blitzing. He believes in, like, playing more zone concepts and things like that. So you bring in a defensive coordinator whose nature is the blitz right. and aggression, of course they're going to be miss, it's not going to work. Right, but I, I think that being on the same page is going to make them better. That's, that's all I'm saying. 
I, I don't think he's a bad because you know in Carolina, you know, I think he showed some problems. Obviously, that's why they hired him. But and also, like I said, Carolina was a dumpster fire. So I, you know, whether he should have fired Carolina was even debatable, right? <laughs> They're just firing guys every, really, literally every year down there. But yeah, I, I think the defensive strategy was definitely a little suspect in the second half and over time. But so you think? So you think it was definitely a mistake to take the ball? Yeah, it's literally no reason. It's, it's essentially turned the college football rules. Right. So if you get the ball, you, you, you win the coin toss, you clearly defer. So you need to know what you need to do to win the game, and you get an extra down. You get a, you essentially get an extra down. Right. So if the Chiefs get the ball first, they go down and score. So what do you know? You need, oh, I need to go down and score. I get an extra, I go forward on fourth down to that. Uh, points out, you get a free down. So I will say this. The Chief, the 49ers defense was winded. They were winded. So giving them a little time off didn't really help. But still, <laughs> <laughs> but I see the thought process uh, there. But even though Pat Mahomes still got the ball, so you you giving Pat Mahomes the ball, knowing he needs it, oh, all I need to do is, is what a kick a field goal. I I do is kick a field goal. So you give and you give Pat Mahomes an, an extra down. Where if you get the ball first, you stop them on a third down. The Chiefs have to punt. Right. But they know they need at least three points. Freedom is different. A different play call is a different mentality versus. Um, versus that, Kyle Shanahan's point was, "Oh, we wanted the ball third, but I was like, but that's you know, that's Mahomes. You're not gonna get the they ball back. They still get the ball fourth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, even I didn't just, get any of the, the rationale there. The only thing I could get, and he didn't even say this, the defense was tired, but he said we wanted the ball third. Yeah, you're not. You have Mahomes on their side. You're not getting the ball back yeah. third. Even if you get a third, the Chiefs still get it yeah. fourth. But, and injury was cooking on that last. That fourth and one RPO and the. That's what happens when you oh, you outthink yourself. Sometimes it's about thinking too much. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. I mean, there's a couple plays too that are big. Like, I think the, the the opening drive, Christian Kaff, if I'm like, yeah, four first out. I'm sorry, three first downs and four plays. Like, mm-hmm. but I mean, it's crazy too because I mean, I if I'm Mahomes, like, like it's funny because I've always said Michael Jordan is like you know Patrick Mahomes NBA player comparison, but. It's like, I don't know if Michael Jordan would have still thrown the ball and Marquez got a scantily. You know, I feel like he just would have gotten done it himself. But, but like, you know what I mean? Like, you know what I'm saying? Or, like, like you think Kobe would have thrown? But you can tell. Like, especially in that game against the Ravens, he lobbed that ball so high. You know that play I'm talking about? So high to MBS. Because he had a ton of drops. They had, they had 2.1 drops per game. Was like, by the way, I didn't want to say, no team in the Super Bowl era is three-peated. Green Bay Packers won the... Um, NFL championship three times, but that wasn't the Super Bowl era. Yeah. So, but yeah, I, I think so. Okay, La- last kind of question before we wrap up for tonight. I'm just here to take on this. Brady or Mahomes, last drive, who are you taking? Mahomes. See, that, I've heard Brady, I've heard, I, I, and I don't know. I, I, I would be great. It'd be great to have either, right? But yeah. why Mahomes? Just from the mobility aspect. Um, I think it's just the mobility aspect. He can make every throw. You know, Tom can make every throw, but he's a genius at processing. But I think I think that mobility aspect gives you just that extra advantage to taking off with your legs. That fourth and one, that fourth RPM. and one, things like that. Especially when teams are playing man, man to man, don't have a spy on, you can just take off, and that's a backbreaker for defenses and things like mm. that. So I think that element of just his legs, I will probably take Pat Mahomes because from a processing standpoint, Brady's probably. Um, better, but he's probably not that much better. Right. Whereas like Pat Mahomes is that much better of a runner than Tom Brady. Was. Right. I say go all t- it's interesting because we literally talked about I had a couple of my friends out here in the early days of this show. Mm-hmm. You know, after the box beat the Chiefs. Mm-hmm. And obviously the Chiefs were down that game. But to to be the go, I think Mahomes gonna have to win eight. Because he lost the Brady head to head. Like I don't think you can you can't put Mahomes the I think he's the greatest, most talented Greatest player, but is he the goat? If you don't, if you don't get that, I know you. I know what you mean. And I think the funny thing about it is, is, the more we move away from Tom Brady being retired, and the more younger people start to watch football, a lot of people are going to associate the goat with being Patrick Mahomes because we're going to get away from people actually. It's like LeBron and Jordan. Yeah, so a lot of people don't grow up seeing Jordan anymore, so they just see LeBron, and LeBron has taken kind of 
the gold over for a lot of people. Um, so I think that it was gonna, it's almost going to be like a battle of generational, generational like argument. Just like, like it is now. <laughs> yeah, like people see Tom Brady it's like, oh no, it's Tom Brady. He beat the he beat Pat Mahomes in the championship. Where it's like people are going to see Pat Mahomes and like, but he has like five or six rings that can do everything. Aspect of it, because so, I don't think he's done with the Super Bowls. No, so. especially with with Andy Reid coming back. Yeah. That defense, we'll see Steve Spagnuolo. Yeah, see if they keep Chris Jones. Yeah, Chris Jones. Yeah, he 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 had two critical plays against Josh Allen against um, Brock Purdy as well. So saved two touchdowns. He did exactly. Yeah, I'll say I don't think the Brock Purdy slander. I don't like the Brock Purdy slander. I think Cam Newton. Throw up the new media. Cam Newton in his podcast. <laughs> I didn't really consider that slander though. He said that he could be a better quarterback than that. He could be playing instead of Brock Purdy. Kim it. Well, uh, he called him what a game manager. Yeah, but he, but he's really not a game manager though. He's a gunslinger. Is he? <laughs> he <hasn't> got, <laughs> he, he, <laughs> did you see some of the throws he tried to make in the Super Bowl? Is he? <laughs> is he? He, he, I, mean, I don't think obviously he was a game manager. Because when you think of gunslinger, you think of like Brett Favre and like Aaron Rodgers. But it's like, is he? <laughs> I don't think he's as good as that. But I don't think he's a game. He's not a game. He's not game manager like Tom Brady. Do you think they like go out and say Brock Purdy witnessed this game? No. <laughs> That's not a different type of gunslinger though. Where like Cal Newton was having to go out and win the game. Like, you think I'm like Cam Newton's just salty though, you know what I mean? He's just salty. Yeah, like Cal Newton took his team to the Super Bowl and who was his best receiver? Uh what well, uh What's the guy's name? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nah, Steve Smith. Steve Smith was him. I don't think he was able to kill him. Oh. <laughs> I don't think he was able to kill DJ him. Moore, I don't know. He had like Devin Funches. <laughs> like, <laughs> players, but. Oh, remember, never forget that Cam Newton sold, but I hopped on that phone. Yeah, but. <laughs> Brock Purdy has like three All Pros, the best left tackle of the game, the best, over, like, the best running back of the game. <laughs> Debo Sam, you know, bring it out. I think Cam Newton's just salty. George Kittle. <laughs> like, had everything. Not too many people that have not going to look good. I think Cam Newton like, is just salty. That's all I'm saying. I think it was just a little, little honesty, and people don't like a little honesty. Nah, see, I disagree with you there. Because he, he was in New England, he was terrible. He went out of Carolina, he, he was, was terrible. terrible. He was. I'm just saying, I'm just putting it out there. He was. But I will say this. I, I do think you hear Jalen Hurts pass the rushing touchdown records of the season for Cam yeah. Newton. It's like, look at Jalen Hurts' run. Cam Newton, when he was like run the ball 50, 60 yards, it was pretty crazy to watch. Jalen Hurts doing the tush push. <laughs> I'm just saying, Buck stopped though, so this is the end of it. And Kelsey's retired. I think the NFL's going to do get around. No, I actually saw reports they're not. Oh, it's almost like, a, you know, being in Australia, it's like a rugby play. Well, do you not like it? I don't like it very much. It, I don't like it when it comes to fantasy football and you're going against Jalen Hurts. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know what they're doing. And yeah, that's, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Uh, I would hate to be a running back for the Eagles because think about yeah. they have all those incentives in their contract. Oh, yeah. Touchdowns and you essentially lose out on most of those <laughs> by thinking it's on the two-yard line. Yeah. We'll see what happens then. Their team kind of fell apart last year. Yeah. But we'll, see. we'll see what happens. Well, Dwight, thank you so much for coming on the show. I've got a quote tonight from a uh, former Navy SEAL uh, Jock Willink, and it's kind of about that idea of practice, discipline, creativity that comes up so much on here. So that, this is a good one. Um, the more you practice, the better you get, the more freedom you have to create. So I think it kind of goes along with our idea of performance anxiety. And I just read his book recently, it's called Extreme Ownership. He was in Ramadi, Iraq, and what he was saying is like, to be creative and to solve problems on the fly during their missions, they would need to be extremely disciplined, extremely practiced. Because if you're not disciplined, and you don't have the practice and preparation you're about, you're not able to change things on the fly. You're not able to communicate effectively to the members of your team. You're not able to be creative in your job. So I think the idea of practicing and preparing that allows you to be creative on the court, the field, in business, whatever. So that's what I want to share that tomorrow. Thank you so much for coming on. I've enjoyed all your takes. We'll have to see which one's come true, right? Uh, oh, I'm gonna have receipts, you, right? Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. I'm not gonna say sons of six this time. I'm not gonna jinx us. We're just gonna let it play out. <laughs> well, thank you so much again for coming on this show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, everyone, we'll be back for one more episode before spring break Tuesday. WJ baseball just scheduled a game Thursday. We've got President Slams. Go check out that next Thursday next show then. But we'll have one Tuesday before spring break. Until then, everyone, have a great night. Don't to live in the present tense.